We're in our second week of a recipe for relationships. And I'm really excited to be able to talk about this today. I would love to see by a show of hands, how many of you love to lose? Great. Thank you for not raising your hand because it would have really thrown off my message. Uh, nobody likes to lose. We all like to come in first, myself included. Uh, it reminds me of a story when I was six years old. And yes, I remember it very well. I'm not just making this up. When I was six years old, I celebrated my golden birthday. How many of you have celebrated a golden birthday before? Okay. Some of you will be celebrating it eventually, I, I think, right? Um, well, for my golden birthday, we had a treasure hunt and we all dressed up as pirates. And yeah, our, it was really, it, it was a, an amazing time. And I was able to invite all of my closest friends uh, to come for this party. And we all dressed up as pirates and we went to Pets Park. How many of you have been to Petrifying Springs before? Nobody. Okay, cool. Uh, well, I've been there before. And for this party, that's where it was located. And it was a treasure hunt. And at the very end was a hidden treasure, much like this. Although I think it was a little bit smaller because my parents were on a budget, which is okay. Uh, it wasn't that big. Uh, but it was hidden at the end. And I was in first place. I was nearing this treasure, and I could see it from where I was. So we had to go through all these clues on the scavenger hunt, all that stuff. And we were nearing the end. And I saw that it was under a really large pine tree pretty far back. And there were two other pine trees. In order to get to this treasure, I had to get on my hands and knees and crawl under this tree. And as I'm making my way forward to get my treasure, out of the corner of my eye, I see one of my best friends. And he's faster than me. He was a little bit more athletic. And he is moving quickly. I'm like, it's on, okay? How many of you are really competitive people? Okay, so in this moment, I think you can guess what happened. Um, I started reaching forward and he was getting a little bit ahead of me and I grabbed his ankle and started pulling him down. I was like, hey, it's going down. I'm getting this treasure. And uh, we ended up grabbing the treasure at the same exact time on either side of the treasure box. And that's when I was scarred for life by my parents. They made me share the treasure. What parent does that? Especially on their birthday. No, it was the right thing. They were teaching me how to share with others. And, you know, that's not always fun. But it, what is funny, even at six years old, is how selfish we are. It's built into our flesh. And I think there's a healthy idea of winning. But the idea that I would literally, like, rip my friend's leg down and punch him. In, no, I didn't punch him. Uh, but really, be so selfish as to not want to share. And we were both pulling on the treasure box. It shows something inside each one of us that often we are willing to do whatever it takes to win, even if it means hurting somebody, even if it means putting ourselves first. And what we're going to be looking at today is what winning in the kingdom of God looks like. We're going to be in Philippians. So if you have your Bible, go ahead and open it up with me to Philippians chapter 2. Uh, Paul wrote Philippians along with Timothy, but Paul wrote it predominantly, and he was in prison when he wrote it. And that's a really interesting understanding for us to, to understand personally, is that Paul wasn't writing on this island in a great season of life, you know, just relaxing on a beach and writing an encouraging letter. He was in prison, and he actually didn't know how his life was going to go. He thought it's possible that he's going to be executed or it's possible that he's going to be able to do some more missionary work, which would probably lead to execution. But he didn't know how his life was going to play out. But what he writes is this thing called a family letter to the church in Philippi. And he had a really unique relationship with the Philippians. It was a very tight-knit relationship. The Philippian church supported Paul financially. They're one of the churches that did that. And Paul was so grateful for them. He said, you share in this ministry. All the fruit that I have as the Apostle Paul, you're actually sharing in it because you're making it possible. And what the Philippians did, they provided for his needs while he was in prison. Because back in that time, when you were in prison, you had to find food for yourself. You weren't given food. There wasn't a system where you were given food. So he really was relying on the Philippian people. But he writes this letter to the church in Philippi to encourage them to stay unified. There, it, it's such a beautiful letter, and I think it's very relevant for us today. Because as a church, as like the chapel, but as a church as a whole, 
we are in a time in life where we could become very disunified. Wouldn't you agree with that? Where we could get stuck on some petty issues or differences and not allow God to work through us because of those differences. And that's exactly what Paul is addressing. It's possible that they're already encountering some of this disunity or that he foresaw that as a potential. But either way, Paul is exhorting them to be unified. So as we jump into Philippians 2, verse 1, I'd love to pray for us that God would speak to us. God, we just ask right now that you would speak to us in a fresh way. God, we don't want to just hear some encouraging words. We want to hear your encouraging words. I pray whatever we're going through right now, Lord, that you would lift our hearts, God, lift our perspectives to share your perspective, God. In your name we pray. Amen. All right, Philippians 2, verse 1. It says, Is there any encouragement from belonging to Christ? Now, Paul wasn't writing that because he didn't know the answer. It's not, he wasn't writing that to sort of figure out, is there any encouragement from belonging to Christ? He's trying to remind them that there is. And I'd ask you today, is there any encouragement from belonging to Christ? Absolutely. Absolutely. He's our identity. He's the one that gives us hope, even when we have a horrible day. He's the one with the Hamans right now as they process everything that happened overnight. He's there with us in our highs, there with us in our lows. So Paul is writing this to say, hey, do you have encouragement in Christ? And he says, any comfort from his love, any fellowship together in the Spirit. This idea that the Holy Spirit actually brings us together. One of the reasons it's so important to meet as a church is because we need each other. We need to be the body of Christ that supports one another. No matter what you're going through, that's why we're here as a church. And then lastly, he says, are your hearts tender and compassionate? I'd like to pause right there for each of us to take personal inventory in our hearts. I want you to ask yourself right now, is my heart tender and compassionate? Go ahead and ask yourself that right now, out loud. Go ahead. All right. Now on that, I'd say not just with the people you like. Not just with the people you like. I think what we need to think through is my heart tender and compassionate, not just with people who believe what I believe and think what I think, but people who are different than me. Is my heart praying God's best for people that I disagree with? And I think that's when we know that our hearts are truly being moved by the Holy Spirit because it's different than what we naturally do in our own flesh. Naturally in our own flesh, we grab for power. We grab for the treasure. Then Paul goes on to say, and it's connected to the questions he just asked. He says, Then make me truly happy by agreeing wholeheartedly with each other, loving one another, and working together with one mind and purpose. This idea of Paul's happiness, it's not this fleeting happiness that like, oh, he's happy. He got candy. No, he's talking about a deep-rooted a joy. Sort of like when your son does a great job at something, you're proud and you're excited for them. You're happy. That gives deep sense of joy. And that's what Paul is saying to the Philippian church. Make me truly happy. And here are the three ways to do that. By agreeing wholeheartedly with each other. Not agreeing in a a way where like, you're like, oh yeah, cool. And then you talk behind the person's back. That's not what he's talking about. He's saying wholeheartedly that there's no division in your heart about how you love one another. Then he says, loving one another. This is a common theme throughout scripture because love is the measure of maturity in the Christian life. You might think knowing scripture better than anyone else, having all the right answers, being the smartest person in the room is the measure, measure of maturity. no. Love is. Love is. Then he says, working together with one mind and purpose. Sometimes we can get confused thinking that uniformity is unity. Where we are all exactly the same. We have all the same ideas. There's zero differences. But I would challenge that and say diversity, it can be a very unifying thing. And actually the way God built his church, for us to all be different parts of the body and build one another up. And the unifying element is Jesus Christ. The unifying element is Jesus Christ. That's how a church can be so different, 
have so many different things that we do, different jobs, different opinions, but we can come together under one umbrella, Jesus Christ. And that's the unifying factor. Philippians 2, 3 says, don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. How many of you have tried to impress others before? I know I have. Come on, be honest here today. Don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble. Thinking of others is better than yourselves. And this idea of thinking of others is better than yourselves. Not just saying that others are better than ourselves, but actually thinking. That's different, right? It, when, what you think is much more do, deeply rooted than what you just say. And he's saying thinking of others in, the, in your person as better than yourself. How many of you have ever been out to eat with somebody that uh, tries to one-up your story? How many of you have ever been in that situation or been hanging out with somebody who the story you tell, they have a better story? Yeah, I would say most of us. Let's check out this video real quick. I'm actually kind of quiet off stage. A lot of people don't realize that. I was at a dinner party recently. A bunch of people that I don't know. One guy talking plenty for everybody. Me, myself, right? And then I, and then myself, right? Me, me. I couldn't tell this one about I because I was talking about myself. And then me, 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 me. Beware the me monster. So I tried to jump in with a little story. I don't want to just sit there the whole night. Right when I'm done with my story, this guy goes, that ain't nothing. <laughs> oh, well, didn't mean to waste everybody's time. <laughs> Telling my nothing story. Here, let Marco Polo speak. He's back with tales of adventure. My story ain't nothing. Maybe it wasn't, because I made the mistake of trying to tell a story about having only two wisdom teeth pulled, and I learned a lesson. Don't ever try to tell a two wisdom tooth story, because you ain't going nowhere. The four wisdom teeth people are going to parachute in and cut you off at the pass. Halt! Halt with your two wisdom tooth tail! You will never complete one, trust me. I'm trying to tell my story. You know, I had some wisdom teeth pulled. I had, um, I had two, but I had four pulled. Oh, okay. No, five, no, nine. I had nine wisdom teeth pulled. All of mine were impacted. They were all coming upside down. The roots were wrapped around my tongue, coming out my nose. They were tusks. I was a warthog. No anesthesia. They pulled them out with pliers. I was eating corn in the cob that afternoon. Pin the blue ribbon upon his chest. That knocks the socks off of my wisdom tooth tail. Oh, I love that. How many of you have ever seen Brian Regan's stuff before? He's a pretty funny comedian. But it's funny because we've all been there before. Some of us have been sitting at a table and somebody's just going on and on, one-upping. And sometimes we are the ones doing that. I've definitely done that before. But it's this idea that we're not to be selfish and try to impress others. I'd ask you this question. When you're sitting at a table, who are you thinking about in that moment? Are you thinking of how you can bless other people? Are you thinking of what could I do to encourage them? Or are you thinking, how do I elevate my status? How do I look larger than life to the people I'm sitting with? It's really a change in our thinking and then a change in our actions. I want to share with you my life verse that really rocked my world probably like seven years ago, and I heard it preached, and ever since then, it's just been something I go to over and over and over again. It's Galatians 1.10. <clears throat> it's Paul that writes this as well. He says, obviously, I'm not trying to win the approval of people, but of God. And catch this part. If pleasing people were my goal, I would not be Christ's servant. I want to read that last part again. If pleasing people were my goal, I would not be Christ's servant. You see this understanding of trying to please people, when that is our heart and goal, we can't please God. We end up elevating people to the seat that God is supposed to have 
in our lives. And why do we do that? Often it's because of selfishness, because we want people to think highly of us. And then Paul goes on to say in Philippians 2, 4, don't look out only for your own interests, but take an interest in others. So he's just hitting on it over and over and over again. And it might sound repetitive because it is. Paul's trying to make a point to think of other people, to value those in your life more than you value your own opinion. And something interesting that I want to share, Paul doesn't say, don't think about your own interests at all. He's not saying like, if you love to golf, you can never golf again because some people in your life don't like that. That's not what he's saying. He's saying just as you think about life and about others, prioritize what other people need. You know, maybe you're thinking about where you're going to go to dinner tonight, and typically you're the one like, I want to go here, and here's where we're going to go, because I want to go. Maybe ask the other person, where do you want to go? Okay, where do you want to go? Just simple stuff, but Paul's trying to really impress on us that it's more of a lifestyle of considering others. I love this quote. It says, I'm not selfish. I just forget to think about other people. I, <laughs> I love it because it's very true. Thinking about other people isn't something that comes naturally. Isn't something that comes naturally. You, often when we think about other people, we're thinking about what do they think about us, not how can I truly serve them. I want to share with you the, the bottom line today. If you get nothing else, this is it. Winning in the kingdom of God is coming in third. Winning in the kingdom of God is coming in third. This is so important for us because we have to adjust the scoreboard in our lives. We're told over and over again, the first person to get the treasure chest is the winner. The first person to get it gets promoted, they get status, they get credibility, all these things. But in the kingdom of God, the score is different. I want to walk you through what it looks like to come in third in the kingdom of God. The first is God first. You cannot effectively serve people if God isn't your first priority because you will be running on empty trying to love people with a human love and not a love that is an overflow of the love you're receiving from your father. And that's why it's so important to prioritize time with God. He actually wants to pour his love into us. He takes delight in doing that. He has a heart for you. He cares deeply about you. So it's not just about meeting with him so that you can minister to others. It's meeting with him to meet with him. It's a relationship that he genuinely wants to spend time with you. And we need to want that as well. Then out of that, we can rightly love others. Others second. This idea that the people in our lives, God has called us to serve them. Not so that they like us, not so that we can become more important, but because God calls us to love others the way Christ first loved us. So others second, and then ourselves third. What I want to be clear on, this is not just like not taking care of yourself. <laughs> this is not just like being self-deprecating or when someone compliments you and says, hey, great job, you're like, oh, no, 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 no. It's God, it's God. That's not what it is. It's not false humility. It's none of those things. But it's understanding that the greatest blessing in life is when we come in third. When we are truthfully seeking God first, loving others out of that relationship, and understanding that God will provide for every need we have, he will bless us in so many great ways, and there is so much joy in giving. And this is a life that God is calling us to. So I'd love to give you some practical handles of what this could look like. Uh, Maybe coming in third at work. Maybe you hear that there's another employee that's been gossiping about you. And what you decide is, you know, I'm going to get my little army and we're going to gossip about that person. No, instead of doing that, maybe he's calling you to bless him. And the only way you'll get a heart like that for somebody who has hurt you is by what? Spending time with God. Because truthfully, we've all done that to God. God, I love you, I love you, I love you. And then we don't show him the love. So maybe at work, God's calling you to come in third. Maybe at home, it's showing your spouse that you care about their needs, not just your own needs. 
Maybe you had a long day at work and you're like, I'm done. I'm taking my shoes off, putting up my feet on the recliner. I've definitely been there before. Okay, I can speak from experience. But asking your spouse, how can I serve you? How can I serve you today? Then doing it. Not leaving a lot of time in between that ask and then actually doing it. Then just doing it. And finding joy in serving others. And in the church, maybe you're not involved in serving at all. And you've had people invite you to serve. You've, people have asked you a lot of times, and you're like, no, no, not for me. Or you're like, well, I, I serve doing this and that. If you're not actively serving in the church, there is so much joy from that. It's not just to fill a position for the church. It's because as you serve, God shows you new things. And I encourage you, you're not engaged in serving, do it. Do it. I don't care where you do it, just do it. Because that's how I started. I got involved in church and started serving, and there were some things I was really good at, some things I was awful at, like kids' ministry, um, <laughs> that I got fired from. No, I, I will say just real quick, a funny story on that. Uh, we were doing a little, like, egg hunt kind of thing, and they put me in charge of it. I don't know why. Um, but they put me in charge of this egg hunt at our last church. And the first round went awesome. The second round went okay. By the third round, I hadn't had the candy and everything sorted out properly to where all the first and second rounders got all the candy. Then the third round, I had all these crying kids. It was one of the scariest days of my life. (laughs) Have you ever seen angry parents before because their kids didn't get candy? It is scary. Anyways, there's a place for you to serve. Maybe not in that uh, vocation, but there's something for all of us. Everyone gets to play in the kingdom of God. So I want you to imagine what would it look like if we as a church truly embodied coming in third everywhere we went, where our schedules, our timeline, our timetable, our priorities were submitted to God's. And we saw people through the lens of how God sees people. I think revival would happen. I really do. I think we'd see so many amazing things happen. So I'd love to invite you to process this question. What is one way you can intentionally come in third this next week? What is one way you can intentionally come in third this next week? As the worship team is going to close us in a song, I'd love for you to really think through that question. What can you intentionally do this week to come in third? And to write it down and be specific. Don't be overly general with it. It doesn't have to be this really lofty, idea or this thing that sounds super intellectual or super like Bible person. No, maybe it's, you know, help my neighbor take their groceries out of their vehicle to their house because they need help. And I know they'll need help on Tuesdays because they always have it delivered that day. I don't know. Be very practical. Let's uh, stand together. I'm just going to close this in prayer. And then we're going to just take time to worship and close together. God, I just thank you so much for your scripture, God. I I thank you, God, that it's relevant today as it was back then, God. And though we're not the church in Philippi, we are the church in McHenry. And you have something special for each one of us, God, to partake in. And the greatest joy we find, Lord, is when we stop focusing on ourselves and what others think of us, God, or how do we get ahead and win. But we start thinking about you and other people. And I pray, Lord, that we'd live a radical life that is oriented around your ways, God. I pray for anyone that is in here that grew up in a really religious kind of environment where it was heavily judgmental, God. I pray right now that you'd free them from that identity. I pray that you'd show them a new way, a new way that we find our yoke with you, Jesus, Lord. I pray right now for anyone that feels discouraged, God, because They know that they've been really selfish lately. And even some of their selfishness has had really bad effects and impact on their family or friends. I pray right now that you would remind them that they are forgiven today. When they repent, God, you offer forgiveness. And today is a brand new day and you're gonna do new things this week, God. We just pray all across McHenry, God, and all the different places that each of us live, Lord, wherever we live, may that be a landing pad for revival. May we see our neighbors differently, the people that we interact with differently. May we not see them as a distraction or something to avoid, but as an opportunity for your kingdom to come on earth as it is in heaven, God. 
pray all this in your name. Amen.